pleasure to see everybody here. We're continuing with the theme of the Churches of Christ and who we are and why we are. And this morning we're going to continue with that. And remember, I put up here that it's an attempt to restore New Testament Christianity. My personal opinion is that needs to be done in every generation. Not that we had it done 150, 200 years ago. Not that it was done actually in the first century. But that in every generation, our children need to be raised to learn some of this. And that every one of us should question and challenge and go to the scriptures for the answers. So that we may truly restore the New Testament Christianity. As we go through this, we, we know people have questions. Who are these people? Why are these people? Uh, why do you not use instruments? Don't you believe in music? That's one of my favorite questions. Don't you believe in music? Of course, my family was steeped in music all of my youth when I was growing up. We sang all the time when we got together. But it's really an issue of scriptures. And the scripture that we really want to start with is not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We can call out to the Lord all we want. We can claim we're Christians all we want. But if we're not doing what the will of the Father is, then we're not Christian. We're not faithful to him. And of course, the recognition that we need to make sure we don't take away or add to anything that's in the scripture. So we go to Revelation 22 and we see that the cautioning there is not to add to or to take away. Basically, what we're talking about is to do Bible things in Bible ways. It's not always that easy. It's something that requires a lot of effort. Some that requires our willingness to give up some of our, our, uh, our pet projects, our pet thoughts, our own thinking on a subject, and let God do the thinking for us. But we want to do things in a Bible way. The word hermeneutics is a word that I'm going to use here. But I use it advisedly knowing that you don't use that word very often in your life. In fact, I would dare say there's some of you here who may have never even heard the word. Are there anybody here who has never heard the word? Okay, there's at least one. Uh, the idea of hermeneutics is how we approach the scriptures, how we approach the interpretation of scripture, and what may or may not be different in the way we do it than somebody else. But basically it simply means the art of interpreting scripture. And I would actually uh, add one more thing, it's the art and science of interpreting scripture because there are some scientific principles to approach that that would make it reasonable and appropriate for us as we do so. But what if anything is different about the way we do it than somebody else? Well, we would presume there would be something different because, well, in the early part of the 20th century, there were some 1,400 different denominations of Christian in the United States of America. That number has gone up since then. Now, if there are hundreds and even thousands of different ones calling themselves Christians, we would presume that they're approaching the scriptures somewhat differently, or we would all come to the same conclusion. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but what is different about the way we approach it? Holiday actually expressed the idea that hermeneutics encompasses both the study of the principles of biblical interpretation and the process through which such interpretation is carried out. That sounds kind of complicated. It's not really very much the principles and the process itself. But we have another one that says it's the science of the interpretation of written text and scientifically formulated rules and principles. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? But what are those scientific rules and principles? I have another interpretation, another translation of that word. Tom Albright from Pepperdine University says it this way. He says it's the perspectives and commitments from which believers put questions to the scriptures. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. How do we approach the scriptures? What kind of questions do we ask of the scriptures? How do we get answers for the questions we have from the scriptures? So what is the hermeneutics of the churches of Christ? Well, I'd like to think that 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 pretty much encompasses it. And that is, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. I'd like to think that's the primary thing, but it's not always the case. But we'll try it that way. We have a reference back sometimes to the Campbells, Thomas and Alexander. And one of the reasons because they did a lot of thinking, a lot of writing, and a lot of work in the effort to try and restore New Testament Christianity back in the early 1800s. Alexander Cramble and Walter Scott, who was another one at this time period, wrote concerning the ancient order. 
and the ancient gospel. Notice the emphasis upon the word ancient. Remember last time we talked about how that if it's not as old as the New Testament, it's not old enough? This is the ancient order that we're talking about right here. Uh, Walter Scott expressed it and says, first of all, we actually determined that the Bible was adopted as the sole authority in our assemblies to the exclusion of all other books. That's the beginning point. Next, the apostolic order was proposed. Apostolic meaning going back to the scripture, finding out what the apostles did and how the church functioned under the apostles of that first century. And finally, the true gospel was restored. We'll come back to these in various places this week and next week. But Alexander Campbell expressed it this way. Number one, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. Now, that sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Why would anybody argue with that? Can you think of any reason why somebody who calls himself a Christian would argue against using that as the standard? Well, the next thing he said is the voice of the Messiah and the apostles. What is that? That's the New Testament, isn't it? Particularly in the whole Bible, what is it that tells us about the church and helps us to understand what we're supposed to be doing? Why, that's the New Testament. Under the title Ancient Order, Alexander Campbell published in the 1820s a series of articles. They dealt with things like the Lord's Supper, fellowship, bishops, Love feasts, purity of speech. They also dealt with deacons, hymns, church discipline, names, and titles. By the way, do they get this right all the time from the very start? I'm not going to go through the history on it too much, but one of the first things they did is they started calling each other elder. There was Elder Lipscomb, Elder Scott, Elder Campbell. Well, when they realized they were using it as a title... They became convinced that they should not do so, and they quit calling themselves that. They didn't believe they should use names and titles like some of the other denominations did, so they didn't call them reverend. They didn't call them uh, by various holiness names, but instead, simply brother, just as they had done in the Old Testament, and just as the Apostle Paul did when he talked about them as well. But the focus was upon the scripture to return to a more literal and historical interpretation the nature, structure, and characteristics of the church were going to be found that way. Going all the way back, though, we find that this is nothing new. Augustine of Hippo, in about 400 AD, expressed this concerning preaching. He says the task of preaching is, dis first of all, discovering the message out of Scripture and then teaching it. Pretty basic, pretty fundamental. I would say that's pretty much a good way to express it. Martin Luther said something else. No violence is to be done to the words of God, whether by man or angel, but they are to be reta retained in their simplest meaning wherever possible and to be understood in their grammatical and literal sense unless the context plainly forbids it. Now that's reasonable, isn't it? God intended this to be understood. He wrote it in man's language. It is not some esoteric language of angels. It is not some sacred language from heaven. It is written in the language of men. And so we should be able to use men's language to understand it better. In order to understand the hermeneutics of the churches of Christ, it's important to perceive that the primary questions we put to the scriptures concern the church and its characteristics. Restoration theology, then, is essentially scripture and church-centered. The purification of the church by the proclaiming of the word of God involves reviving its faith, reconstructing the doctrine overhauling every department of ecclesiastical life and practice. Now, overhauling is part of the problem. Some thought they could overhaul the practice of the Catholic churches, reforming it to make it conform to God's word again. Finally, by the time these restorers came about uh, several centuries later, they decided that, that wasn't working. They needed to go further than that and actually go back to the beginning. Zwingli, a great theologian from that time period, also influenced John Knox and the Scottish Presbyterians and the Campbells who came through Scottish Presbyterian background. Now what I'm doing is I'm showing you the historical background and theological background of some of the people that became some of the thinkers in developing the Restoration concept. Zwingli also influenced the English Puritans. Now that's something we sometimes forget is there was an influence for some of these as well. <clears throat> 
From these important churchmen in the British independence of various stripes, we then had this concept. They believed that Christianity needed most of all a return to the ancient paths and purifying the church. Zwingli presented the scriptures on our master, teacher, and guide. He recognized these and he recognized also the danger of bringing our own ideas to the scripture. We shouldn't go to the scripture to confirm our own thoughts, our own opinions. We should instead go to the scriptures to form our opinions and our thoughts. Zwingli spoke of both the commands of Christ as well as biblical examples. However, he never put it together as a hermeneutic principle, but he had the right idea and expressed it accordingly. Edward Daring in the 1500s, also a Puritan, expresses the idea of commands, examples, and influence, inferences. Inferences was something a little different and a little new. This was something that needed to be looked at a little bit harder and make sure we understood what it meant. But basically he argued that the conclusions based on scriptures drawn from proportion or deduction or by consequence are just as much the word of God as that which is an express commandment or example. The formula rose to the forefront of the middle of the 20th century as basically the consensus hermeneutic of the Churches of Christ. Barnas Sears, one of the professors at Newton Theological Seminary, expressed one poetic and popular languages are to be in translated so as they may be into the exact language of science. There has to be some sort of logical principle. It can't just be all feelings. How does this scripture make you feel? I hate that question. I don't want to hear it in our churches. I don't want to hear it in our Bible classes. How does that scripture make you feel? There's a time and place for that kind of a question probably, but not in interpreting scripture. Interpreting scripture should be used with some sort of principle that guides us that is not a feeling or an emotion. <clears throat> Subjects must be analyzed philosophically as far as can be done. Subjects such as repentance, faith, love, regeneration, and sanctification. There are principles there we can learn and use these in a consistent manner. And also, too, the relations of doctrines to each other must be able to be ascertained in order to preserve their harmony. They don't always show what they uh, have in common with each other, but they do have, uh, okay, there we go. I was one off, sorry. The uncertain must conform to the certain. Our inferences must not set aside divine authority. You're getting a sense of the principles that are being decided upon and being accepted and how we're approaching the scriptures with these in mind. We don't just arbitrarily pull the scripture out of context and put that up there and says, well, the words say this. And those words in context may not mean that, though. We've got to recognize that and do it accordingly, do it properly. Do it without violence to the text itself. Thus came the idea to express clearly and uh, the express and clear declaration of scripture and simple and necessary inferences. These became a standard then, became something we can hang our hat on. Zwingli also said the church must not retain traditional forms or ceremonies simply on the grounds that the scriptures do not forbid them. Now I'm pausing there because that's a very important thought. Why would we do something simply because the scriptures don't forbid it? Why would we do something only if the scriptures authorize it? Remember, this is God's word we're talking about here, isn't it? If it's God's word, then God is telling us something, and we need to think that that is important. Now, I know when I went to the store when I was young, and Mama would give me a quarter to go to the store and buy a can of corn. I'm showing my age. I'm sorry. You could buy a can of corn for less than that back then. But she didn't have to tell me that not to use the change to buy candy as well. She expected me to bring the change home. And she'd already told me what she wanted. She didn't expect me to bring green beans back or something else. Definitely not hominy. We never used hominy in our home. But she said, go buy a can of corn. I knew that when I went to the store to get a can of corn, I knew what my job was. I knew what the parameters of my job were as well. The limitations of my task, if you would. Without her having to tell me, do not. Do not. 
Can you imagine how big the Bible would be if God felt he had to say, do not to everything that he didn't want in every generation, in every time period, among every people's, this would be an unwieldy book that we would never be able to get out of the building because it would have to sit on a podium and it'd be a whole volume, a whole sh shelf of other books going along with it telling us thou shalt not. He doesn't have to do that though, does he? He instead tells us what should be done. Puritans launched a major attack on the Church of England and especially in regard to details of worship. These included things like vestments. You'll notice I don't wear a robe up here. It's actually on layaway, but uh, that's a different issue. Vestments, ornaments, robes, the sign of the cross, organs, ecclesiastical vestments, and courts. The Puritans attacked the Church of England because they had all these things. They brought to Christianity the rhetoric of a pure church as opposed to a state church. Now, we, we know the history well enough to know that there were large battles fought. Many people died. Catholics against Protestants, Protestants against Catholics, numerous times which people were uh, persecuted, sometimes just for having a copy of the scriptures in the common language, which there were many times when those things were considered a heretical, deadly sin. But this was the issue, the pure church as opposed to the state church. While the Campbells and other early re Restoration leaders had, the, uh, direct tie, had no direct ties to Puritanism, they were nevertheless influenced by a lot of these influenced by a lot of these thoughts. They championed one church over against multiple churches. And so we asked the question, what are the parameters of this one church? The solution was to reject all creeds. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? If, if creeds actually create the division, or at least define the division, then creeds have to be rejected. And to rebuild the Church of Christ, we should do it bit by bit, plank by plank, from the oracles of God, the scriptures, and particularly the New Testament. The language of the Bible, however, is a human language. It's to be examined by all the same rules which are applicable to language of any other book just as well. One of my favorite examples of that is using the idea of a metaphor. If it is intended to be uh, symbolic, then we should understand it that way. We shouldn't take it literally. There are other issues that come up periodically as well. But it is to be understood according to the true and proper meaning of all the words in the context of the times and in the places in which they were originally written or translated. You wonder why sometimes we go back into history and talk about it when we talk about the particular scripture. Why we show the historical context, sometimes of the Roman Empire, sometimes of the Jewish leadership, sometimes of the Greek context, of the paganism that they were involved with. Sometimes we go back and show these things so that the words' meanings can be understood properly in the context of which they come out of. However, remember, the literal sense is also called the grammatical. The word literal is a Latin word, which actually is used to translate the Greek word grammatic, grammatical, meaning reading or knowing one's letters. We used to talk about that in the English language as well. Are you a man of letters? Are you a man who reads? In fact, we used to talk about reading for a degree, because a lot of what it involved was reading various documents to get to the point we understood enough to be considered a doctor of whatever that particular field was. The standard approach to hermeneutics of the 19th century became to reject mystical and allegorical interpretation in favor of literal. Now I put this in here because it's important to remember there are people today that are into that emotional uh, allegorical or, or whatever, but this is nothing new. This goes all the way back to the second century in which there was a movement in, in uh, Egypt, for example, to allegorize everything in the scripture. Genesis chapter 1 was not a literal seven days of creation. It was all just a picture of God creating. The flood was not a literal flood. It was just a picture of God's judgment. And they went on and allegorized everything. And then they made emphasis of breaking it up into little bits and pieces and identifying what the allegory of each part meant. But the 19th century, that was in the 1800s, there was a recognition that that was not a fruitful way of scientifically looking at scripture. So we decided to reject mystical and allegorical methods. Thus the principles we came up with were the command, example, and necessary inference formula, 
the dispensations, and the grammatical historical aspects. That sounds formal to you, but I'll get to it in a minute. Stated in our language today, commands. I don't need to say both direct and indirect, but I did so in parentheses to show you. The uh, approved, or the, the, the approved example, I didn't have to put approved in there, but you know there are examples in the scripture that we aren't necessarily supposed to follow either. So an apostle approved example would be appropriate. And the necessary inference, and I put necessary in there because it's not understandable unless there is an inference that is drawn from it. For example, direct command. Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized. Now, that's a pretty much a direct command, isn't it? Now, it's not to us, it's to them, but it would imply that it's into us as well. A direct command that gives us a specific command to repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. Now, the indirect command, here's an example of possibly one, Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. It is somewhat of a command form, but it's more generalized and more indirect in the way it is given to us. Uh, an approved example, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when we gathered together to break bread, Paul discoursed. It apparently was a common thing to gather together on the first day of the week. And the breaking of bread was done during that time. Why do we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Because that's what they did in the New Testament. That's the approved example. And then the necessary inference, uh, I'll go to 1 Corinthians 16 on this one for the collection of the saints. But again, upon the first day of the week. On the first day of which, which first day of the week? There's 365 days in a year, there's uh, 50 some odd first days, aren't there? Well, which one? The necessary inference would be every one of them, wouldn't it? So we have these principles established. Our hermeneutic simplified then would be command Example and inference. The dispensations. There's a difference between the old and the new. They work together. But we don't go to the Old Testament to find a specific doctrine for the church, which is actually based on the New Testament. And the grammatical and historical context. We actually know what the language says and put it into context there then. And so we come up with this passage that says he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Do we believe that? If we do, then we will approach the scriptures in such a way as to find out what it is we're supposed to do. This has not been a lesson designed to change your heart, but I pray that it's been a lesson that has been helpful, that you will be able to chew on it for a while and go through the scriptures and begin the process of learning from the scriptures more than what you have in the past. But we're going to offer an invitation as a matter of our custom right now. And if you need to come in repentance, or if you need to come before God to be baptized for the remission of your sins, then you're invited to do so now while we stand and while we sing.